I was talking about about Justin Bieber, and I brought up this song. It's called Lonely. I happen to be a, a Bieber fan, and that song just just knocked me out. Just knocked me. And jo- Jordan was laughing at me. Oh, you like Bieber? I like Moreno. You know. So, I, but anyway, it's just it's worth checking out, Michael, and maybe it, it, listen to it sometime. Let me know what you think. Well, for the first time in my life, I'm going to be Googling a Justin Bieber song, and I'm going I'm going to listen to it with an open mind. Good. Thank you. This is. Governor John Casey Common says. Rook, see? <laughs> Common ground. <laughs> Finally. Hey, Jordan. Good to see you today. Um, and good to talk to you. Hey, you know, I've been thinking Actually, about... Actually, Governor, some, before... You know, I'm yeah. going to even stop you right there. Okay, Jordan. Because I want to paint a, I want to paint a picture for our audience at home who doesn't get to see what I get to see, which is you in front of a microphone with literally a cord uh, dangling from the camera angle. So what I look like, it looks like I'm looking up the the ass of the microphone, to be quite honest. (laughs) And and then also there's something clearly unplugged, which is going to be audio problems up the wazoo whenever our editors take a look at this. You know, look at all the trouble they had in launching the first rocket. I mean, it's it's just going to take some time. Is that what it felt like to find the record button? It felt like a Herculean task. It was very, very exciting. And, you know, you and I have talked about about this Bruce Springsteen deal. You know, uh, half a billion dollars that Springsteen sold his music to. I don't know who had it before he sold it. I guess he did, but I, I don't know who bought it. But here's the thing, you know, when I was in school early on, I took up clarinet. And I, I think I should have at least played the guitar or drums. And here's Springsteen, you know, selling this for, I mean, a half a billion dollars. Can you believe it? That's, clarinet, not not the coolest of instruments. Although Springsteen, I will, I will admit, Springsteen definitely employed uncool instruments. I still think the saxophone is one of the least sexy instruments out there. And yet he found Clarence, who, who made it sexy, and rest in peace, would have made a killing off of all this. Would you, are you a Springsteen fan? I, I think maybe people don't know, I wouldn't. When we started talking about doing a podcast together, one of the things we bonded over was uh, uh, a shared love of music. Are you a are you a Springsteen fan? Yeah, well, I, I I do like him. You know, I think I mean, who who wouldn't? Who couldn't like the the work that uh, Springsteen has done? And let's turn to the Beatles. And you know, Jordan, I watched I, well, all eight hours of that of that documentary. I, I like the first one. I like the third one. The second one I thought was a little tedious, but. You know, I mean, to see McCartney come in the uh, in the studio and and just start you know strumming on his guitar and figuring out how to come up with "Get Back." I mean, that in and of itself was like, I mean, amazing, don't you think? I mean, the whole series was incredible. I know, I uh, I loved it. I thought it was a uh, a long but uh, worthy look at the creative process. Uh, I think I got in a, a fight with my wife over all of this. I mean, you can't help but spend nine hours with a loved one watching uh, a documentary <laughs> and then choose which one you are. And I think I definitely came down as as a Paul, a supporter of a Paul. He brought in all the good ideas. He kept things moving. She had more empathy for for John, although a little disappointed in some of the ideas he brought in and, and more of a George fan. I, I'd be curious to see who you saw yourself as, Governor. Well, you know, what it did for me is that uh, I, I got to see Lennon as like a, a real guy and not almost a caricature of the way he'd been described. And, you know, you got to remember that, I mean, Paul might have written about 55% of the Beatles songs and, and uh, you know, John wrote the rest of them. And But here's the way I look at it. I think, you know, McCartney was the melody and Lennon was the edge and uh, put the edge in the songs. And since they broke up, I think the best song written since they broke up was probably Lennon's song "Imagine." Uh, but when I when I'll tell you trite. I, that trite BS, you yeah, really buy really, that? Really. You have to buy no. that. Oh, you probably <laughs> still believe in the American dream. <laughs> you know, I, here's the interesting thing. You know, Al Pacino told me don't be a name dropper. But I was talking to Lionel Richie about this during the third. Uh, <laughs> did Pacino tell you <laughs> yeah, that he when did. you happened to hang yeah, out yes, with yes. him? <laughs> but but d- during third, I I called Lionel and I said, Lionel, how is this possible? As you looked at at them running through it, they did 14 songs in about 21 days. And he said, 
John, what you have to understand is they completed each other's sentence. They knew exactly the emotions of one another. And when you brought that together, you had magic. And the other thing I found is, and we know that Harrison walked off the set, I think Harrison always felt as though he was disrespected, and he had an awful lot to offer. I don't know if you know this story, but Harrison apparently called uh, Eric Clapton, and he said, come to my house, but you have to come early for breakfast. Come really early while it's still dark. And they sat in Harrison's garden, and he strummed as the sun came up, here comes the sun. I mean, what an unbelievable story. All the while, Clapton's just spouting anti-vax BS. And you're like, come on, Eric, can we focus? We got a great song to write. <laughs> Do, if, if we're going to name drop, can I, can I name drop my sure. one Beatle, my close Beatles? Uh, at the Daily Show, uh, it's a, the, the old Daily Show studio, um, Paul McCartney came on as a guest. The, the show said very clearly, this is Paul McCartney. Don't interact with Paul McCartney. So everybody does that, and I'm in an edit bay, which Paul McCartney happens to walk by, and you leave the door open because you're aware Paul McCartney's there, and he walks by to get on set, and you can he's clearly looking around, but nobody's talking to him. It's just silently Paul McCartney goes on. We go back to our edit. He does a little interview, and he comes back, and you can tell, you hear down the hall that he's excited and energetic, uh, and he walks back past our edit bay, and I see he turns the corner to go back to his dressing room, and then he comes back around and he runs right into our edit bay and he starts doing bits about uh, the edit that we're currently in. And we all kind of are taken aback and then jump in to see if he has any advice and how, how bullshit these song choices were. And he just starts making fun of all of us in the edits we've made. He probably plays for five minutes. And you could tell that this is a guy who he comes to this show. It's a comedy show and he wants somebody to play with and he's sort of been instructed to don't interact with paul don't play with paul and he's like this is why i'm here to to be goofy and to play and i feel like when i watched get back i think that's part of his superpower is that he was he was playful he, yeah. he always wanted to be he's curious always wanted to keep going and even part of i think a, a narrative in get back is just how long it takes for people to get the the sound right as we no setting up this podcast, but you have to keep that energy in the room. Otherwise, they're not going to have it when they actually have to perform something. And that seemed to be sort of a, a superpower those guys had is that they were they were willing to play and keep the energy and the bit in the air long enough that when they actually pushed pushed play to record, uh, they were they were ready for it. Yeah, and um, fun to watch. And it took up too much of my time though because I need to spend more time <laughs> reading. So I understand we have a, a good guest. You know. John, as we started to talk about maybe doing a podcast and having people on, one of the ideas was that we each would bring somebody we're interested in talking about uh, on, introduce them to the other person, talk a little bit about them. And I'm very excited. Our guest today is somebody I've been a fan of since I was very young and continue to be a fan of now as I enter into just slightly over what is very young. But He looks younger been, than you do, though. It's he, interesting. He, he definitely wears it better than I do, yeah. but you know him from things like The State, from Wet Hot American Summer. He's a stand-up comedian. He's an actor. He's a writer. He's written such books as A Child's First Book of Trump, I'm Worried, and America, You Sexy Bitch with Meghan McCain. Also, one of my favorite books, A Reflection on Masculinity, uh, called A Better Man, A Mostly Serious Letter to My Son. We welcome to the show, Michael Ian Black. The governor is well aware of my MTV work. Well, I was going to say, we, the governor and I talk about uh, Taco Mailman, like you I'm wouldn't sure. believe. The Captain Monterey Jack references that he makes. <laughs> like, enough. Uh, part of why I wanted to have Michael on the show and to talk with the, the governor uh, with Michael is I do think, Michael, I think you're an uh, incredibly funny, thoughtful guy. But what, what I'm mostly curious about and inspired by is... Uh, a very funny young comedian who has found a way to age into this interest, uh, industry to reflect on some of the bigger issues and we're talking a little bit more about some of your books and a better man and kind of dealing with a chaotic world as a comedian and, and finding a way to kind of handle that, discuss it, find humor, and also age. I'm looking for a way to die as a comedian, and I feel like you might have the blueprint. Um... Yeah. I mean, I think there's so many good ways for comedians to die. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I mean, I, I don't know. I'm probably just going to go in a traditional way. You know, I'll probably just stroke, I'll probably just stroke out at some point. 
<laughs> yeah, okay. Well, that's at least it's it's a uh, that's for a more cerebral comic. I think at least people can read into it that way. Uh, uh-huh. <laughs> you know, Michael, well, I, I've got to tell you that I I spend some time really looking at who you are, and um, you know, you have a sister with Down syndrome. You lost your father when you were. 12 or 13 and you've never quite understood that you grew up in a in a, a household that was <laughs> far from traditional and 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 you know I think that's something that you've kind of struggled with right you're dealing with I should say I mean it's not been easy for you and as you've gone through that and you've thought about uh, all of that your life and and dealing and dealing with it figuring it out I I take it it's given you insight and probably some compassion into the lives of of other people. Would that be fair to say? I hope so. But I, you know, I hope I I hope that the challenges that anybody goes through does the same, because this you know my own circumstances, uh, as you said, I grew up in a lesbian house. I mean, you didn't say lesbian. I'll say a lesbian household. My dad died when I was young, and you know, various. Uh, issues and problems that came along with that. And, but, you know, my, my circumstances are specific to me, but, but the emotions and, and troubles that I went through are probably common among just about everybody. And, and I would hope that whatever issues that we all deal with and whatever struggles we all go through help us to build empathy and compassion for others, knowing that essentially we're all going through the same stuff, just with different names attached to it. Michael, let me let me just follow up, Jordan. Let me follow up on this for a second because I think to 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 examine oneself deeply and to figure out the areas where we are troubled, um, it takes uh, it takes a bit of courage. I always like to tell people that when when you think you're strong, you're actually weak, but when you're weak, you're actually strong. If you can admit your weaknesses and begin to look at them. Uh, that's something that you've, you're really kind of talking to your son about, my understanding. You know, the, the issue of masculinity. It's okay to cry. It's okay to say it hurts. It's okay to tell somebody, you know, I love you who's not even in your family, right? I mean, that is a big issue we have today with people being locked up inside their own, their own minds. And I think we've got to give them freedom to escape, to admit their weaknesses, to find somebody who they can bear their soul to, because that will then make them stronger. That's my sense. I agree. I mean, one of the theses in my book, A Better Man, which it's subtitled A Mostly Serious Letter to My Son, because it is mostly serious, although, Jordan, thank you for finding the humor in it. There was some. um, Is that we are at our strongest when we expose our own vulnerabilities. Mm. Because it mm-hmm. takes a tremendous amount of strength to say, to admit your weakness. It t- and I'm, I'm speaking specifically about men, although I think it's ap- applicable to women too. But for men, it's so hard for us to just kind of bear our bellies and say, this is my soft spot, you know? And I'm exposing it because... Be, because I'm I'm weak here, but knowing, but having that that power and strength to know that you can survive whatever's coming mm-hmm. at you, but you have to admit your weakness, I think, to understand Amen. your own strength. I, I will say so, Michael. I picked up your book. I I, I have a son now. Did you pay retail uh, for it? I, oh yes. Okay, uh, that's all I care about. Yes, no, don't worry. Full price. They, they were they were offered. It was in they, there's an area called a a, a discount bin <laughs> that I pulled it from. <laughs> I took the sticker off and I paid full price. Thank so you. you. Thank hopefully you, so you got. Hopefully you got all that money. Um, <laughs> uh, but I was. I mean, I, I've been compelled. I was interested in this book for for many reasons. But selfishly, I was about to have a child. My wife was pregnant. I was contemplating this idea of what does it mean to be a good father. Uh, and I. I will say what I find one of the challenges that I had and the questions that I have is somebody who comes from. I. I I'd like to think that I am uh, emotionally intelligent, but. But I, I, I do know you are somebody who is a comedian who kind of found this place to be reflected and very open. And there's not a lot of comedians who have written books like that. And you said something in here that resonated with me. You talked about you spent years hiding under the armor of sarcasm and withdrawal, <laughs> which I will say even as a comedic tactic is something as a, as a, a young co- comedian, those were the tools I thought that I was using to find comedy. Heightened characters, sarcasm, those are the 
I mean, they're tools that have maybe shifted over the last 10, 20 years. But I, I read that, I'm like, oh, I, I understand that toolkit. And I'm wondering if inadvertently the comedy that you're doing, the comedy I felt myself was doing, was was almost creating a character of with, with the point of view or the values of an old-timey bad dude. Did you, did you feel yourself uh, having to sort of... Uh, reckon with these these tools you maybe were using to find humor that then became personality? Yeah, th- uh, absolutely. I spent a long time honing my comedic craft um, through the use of, you know, sarcasm, being deadpan, never allowing any sort of true emotion to shine through in what I was doing. And I, I found it more and more limiting the further I got into not only my career, but my life, because that persona was only a slightly heightened version of who I was in the, in the real world. Like I, I, one of the ways I think I dealt with childhood pain was to shut off. Um, I think that's true for a lot of guys. We, we withdraw because that's one of the tools that we're sort of permitted to have. We're allowed to be mad at times and we're allowed to withdraw. We're not allowed to sort of just emote and be vulnerable. Um, So I chose withdrawal and that turned into a pretty good comedic career for me until I found it untenable until I found that I had a wife and a kid and, and, and I wanted to be more emotionally available and I could, I couldn't reconcile how to, be the better person that I wanted to be for them and still be this person that I was presenting myself as on stage and in front of a camera. And so something had to give. Um, and so I, 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 I consciously decided to start doing emotional work on myself and let the chips fall and let that affect the work that I was doing and let the chips fall there too. Because it was that, risky. It was yeah, risky. You, you, know, you know, Michael, it's, you know, I, right away what flashes in my mind is Robin Williams, okay? Mm-hmm. And I wonder how many comedians go on stage and have, do their thing, uh, th- which is hiding the inside of themselves that, that one day may explode. And I, I give you all the credit in the world for saying, you know, I, I couldn't continue to do that. It, it's really, really fascinating. How did you find a way to deal with a, a number of these serious issues. You've just revealed a lot of deeply personal things. So how would you suggest that somebody who's struggling with these things, what do they do? How do they start? I, I'm going to answer that question. And, and I want to ask you a question afterwards, because, because you, you brought up something that I think is interesting. And I want to know more from your point of view. Um, I don't know that there is any one place to start. The, maybe, the place, maybe the place to start is to recognize um, your own fallibility, your own idiocy, your own emotional unintelligence, your own vulnerabilities, recognizing that, especially as men, we're brought up to believe that we have the answers, even though we know we don't. We're brought up to kind of fake it till we make it. It's a common phrase, and it's embraced by a lot of people. In some ways, it works, um, but in a lot of ways, it can leave you feeling a little shortchanged uh, in, in, in yourself. There, do, there does have to come a point, I think for most people, where they have to take stock, pat themselves on the back for the good that they've done and for the good that they are, um, because there's also not a lot of, an, enough of that done. But also, take, when you take stock, to, to recognize the places where you feel like you're falling short, where you feel like you could do better, and drill into those things. And if you're not sure what those things are, I would suggest move towards the things that scare you. Move towards those emotions that frighten you, towards those circumstances that frighten you, the words that you feel like you want to say to somebody that may frighten you. Um, get comfortable, or at least try to get comfortable in, in, in sitting in your own discomfort. And in, in that way, I think, lies growth. But I want to ask you, Governor, you said that uh, comedians often in their work are hiding, which I think is true. I mean, I think it's true for a lot of performers. I think the best performers actually aren't, but I think for a lot of performers, they are. But I'm wondering in your profession as a politician, one of the things that constantly befuddles me is there is always the public face of the politician, and then we know there's a private face. 
How do you as a politician reconcile those two things and in the, in, in, in the company you keep of politicians, the, 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 the famous faces that we see on cable news every night or wherever, when you know the person that they're presenting themselves as isn't the person that they are in private, how, how do you imagine those people reconcile that, that contradiction? You know, it's interesting. First of all, I don't have many close friends who are involved in politics. You know, I just don't, don't live there. Don't, I don't exist there. But I grew up in a town, uh, McKees Rocks. It was blue-collar, Democrat, you know, bordering on poor. And I learned early on to not – just to let it all hang out, fortunately, and let it all hang out. Say what you think. Do what you think. Think about other people. But I have to tell you guys, and I've not really spent any time talking to Jordan about this, but – in 1987, my mother and father were killed by a drunk driver. And I had an opportunity to find out two things. One, where I was vis-a-vis -vis my faith. And secondly, who is John Kasich? Just like you did, Michael. What's my strengths? What's my weaknesses? And so I did a, a complete look, a complete exam. And it set me so free. And... I also, because I have a faith, I also know that life is short and I have somebody that cares about me. And, and so I'm free. What I worry about, because I do spend time in the mental health area, are people that can't seem how to get free. They don't know where to go. They, and, and it's really, really serious stuff. But for me, it's been pretty easy. And, you know, I've just always, my jobs were always pretty easy because I just tried to figure out what's the best thing to do. And I didn't give two cents about the politics. And Jordan doesn't know me very well, but he's going to learn over time. It's kind of the way I operated. I'm going to call it like I see it. I don't care what party you're in. It didn't mean anything. But what I worry about with politicians today is they're, they think that they are defined by their job. And when you are defined by your work and you think you have power and you are afraid to let it go, Man, that's ugly. And that's what we're seeing in our country today. People that want power, but it's true everywhere, right? If you're a CEO, you don't want to let go. If you're a, Look, you've written about the fact that you've not made it to the top in your field. You go, I made it pretty much there, but I haven't done it yet. You know, you've accepted that. A lot of people can't accept the fact that, you know, they just might not make it or they ought to just give it up for a while. So, I'm I'm a very happy guy. I'm very happy with myself, and and I just let that shine through. And if you see any of my commentary, it's kind of straight down the middle, and it's it's direct, and that's kind of what I do best. Jordan, did you hear the the governor take a, a dig at me? He hasn't made it to the top of his field. My <laughs> goodness, it's <laughs> <That's> so cruel. <laughs> this is uh, I didn't know it was going to take I, that turn. Yeah, I I sent him I sent him the pants sketch, and I thought he watched it. Um, He's um, a mean man. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I will say this: I think um, we're we're going to pick on you and your your inability to really make it to the top, Michael. Uh, so if we really, you know. <laughs> We really let's let let's let's dissect this. I I, I read a quote quote you had though. Um, I think you were talking in reference about your your mother and this idea. Uh, looking back on life, talking about wanting to do more, and a thing that stood out to me was the word legacy. And you, if I if I'm I'm paraphrasing you here, but this idea that you weren't interested in legacy beyond what you passed to your kids. And I I do think in a in an ego driven industry call it the world of entertainment, call it politics. It feels as if legacy is always first and foremost on the, the front line. Uh, wh 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 why is your mindset there where legacy is no longer there? And is that something you, you, you grew into that opinion or was that there from the get-go? Uh, I think when I started thinking about it for the first time, I realized I, I, I don't give a, uh, I, I can, I mean, the, gov the governor's a man of faith, but I can, I don't give a shit in the professional realm. I don't care about that um, because, you know, you think about it and you think about like who has a legacy, like across the centuries, who has a legacy? Julius Caesar, you know, and what's the best we can hope for if you have a legacy like Julius Caesar? Some sixth grader is going to write a report on you, 
You know, like that's pretty much the best we can hope for. And I've read those book reports. They're terrible. <laughs> They're really awful. They don't put in the time or effort. <laughs> they really don't. And like that's the best case scenario. Is <laughs> some sixth grader is going to write a report? I don't care. You know, I don't care. What I care about is um, that my kids feel like they were loved. That my kids feel like you know they 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 have a good foundation to move forward into the li- into their lives. Um, that my wife feels like she was loved, and that you know she didn't make a mistake by marrying me. And the rest of it, I I just don't really care about. I don't care if there's a funeral. I don't care if they flush me down a toilet. It doesn't matter. None of it matters, you know? Um, I'm happy when somebody likes my work. Like, that gives me pleasure. And I hope that it gives them pleasure. But it's, it's like the governor just said, like, people who identify themselves too closely with their work, I think end up in a, in a in a trap of their own making and it, it most of the time that stuff just isn't that important you know it just isn't we'll be right back and now back to the show let me let me ask you this uh, for both of you guys you know um, I, we all know about the cancel culture right i i don't know how you deal with that when you're up there on the stage having to say things that make people laugh but what do you guys think about the fact that increasingly the society we live in we can't laugh at our, at each other we can't laugh at ourselves what's the implications of that what do we do about that or am i overreacting to that tell me tell me what you guys think jordan do you want to go well i i, I will say i mean it's hard to speak about in broad terms because i do think cancel culture gets applied to so many different situations in a way that is unhelpful for the larger conversation and just becomes uh, sort of an excuse that people use to patch up uh, other issues that they don't want to confront. I think within the comedy world, I think it is overblown. I, I think there are, I think there's a difference between canceling and consequences. And I've always felt like if you get in front of a microphone, people are going to listen to what you say. So you might want to be aware of the things that you say in front of a microphone. And more often than not, I'm seeing the term cancel culture used for comedians and I've seen these comedians flourish and use the the false uh, hubbub around the idea of cancel culture to sell more tickets and prove that they're not being canceled. So so I personally, you know, in my small little bubble, I don't I don't fear that in the sense that I think that's how a lot of the comedians that I know have approached the work that they do to begin with is that there's somebody watching. So be aware of the things that you say. And that, of course, there are places where you want you want sympathetic ears to understand the things that you're saying and the context with which they say it. And perhaps we need to make more of an effort to make that context clear. But I think that effort in and of itself is is beneficial to all of those. And 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 more often than not, the complaint is more overblown than the actual um, the actual thing that is so so called being being canceled. I, I agree with that wholeheartedly. One of the things that we're conflating is the idea of cancel culture with, say, the Me Too movement where powerful men are getting, quote unquote, canceled or at least facing some yeah. consequences for misbehavior on their parts. That's one thing. And then on the other side or the other thing is the idea that uh, comedians or anybody really is no longer, or, or people are no longer free to express themselves without fear of repercussion. So I'll just say from a comedian's point of view, one of the thing, and, and, and I think that that is true. I think that people are facing repercussions for things that they are saying that they might not have faced repercussions for before. Yes, we can look at that and say, gosh, that's a slippery slope. We can also look at it and say, at least in, from a comedian's point of view, that it's a real opportunity. And I think it has been for a lot of comedians. And the opportunity is this. It used to be that you could get on stage and just kind of throw defamatory terms out there <laughs> and get laughs. Um you know, maybe, maybe, maybe you had to do a little bit more than that, but not much more than that. Cheap comedy. Cheap, cheap comedy. Cheap comedy, yeah. I think comedians can still basically say whatever they want to say. However, they better be 
be prepared to defend it. And what that's doing is it's making comedians think a lot more deeply about their jokes. It's really making people, comedians, think about their material in a way that I don't think that they were necessarily doing um, 15, 20 years ago. And it's made comedians better. Now, I I was somebody who was out there very publicly criticizing Dave Chappelle for his last special, not because I wanted him quote unquote canceled. I don't think such a thing is possible, nor do I think it's warranted. Um, but I think he I think I think he I think he did himself a disservice in that last special. If you're unfamiliar with it, he he spends a good deal of time criticizing the LGBT community and in particular the T portion of that community. Um and I, I was one of, I think, the few comedians who was just out there just saying it It was bad. It was bad. He shouldn't have done it. And, and I explained why I thought it was bad. That doesn't mean I want him canceled. It means that he's putting a, a product out there. He's putting work out there, art out there, and I'm critiquing it the way any work should be critiqued. Um, I had no problem with Netflix employees getting upset with him. I had no problem with him responding. I had no problem with any of it. But I think those conversations, which I think are good conversations to have, are more likely to happen now than they would have been 10 or 15 years ago. And, and that's a result of this, you know, call it whatever you want, cancel culture, woke movement, Me Too, whatever you want to call it. Those conversations needed to happen. They're overdue, and I'm glad they're happening. How do you, Michael, as a father— uh approach conversations around around that around where culture is now around oh i don't speak to my can... children oh great yeah the, we don't we don't we uh, we don't have a relationship it's just easier that way <laughs> it's so much easier <laughs> they probably um, don't care what you think anyway it's your oh, wife that's raising them so let's don't. just get to the bottom yeah, line kids do you want to know what you i know, think about these, the latest no. netflix special <laughs> no you know all these dads think you know in the beginning they all think they matter so much and uh, and at times they can. It depends on what the family is. But a lot of times I found in my life that, that my wife was so critical. Now I'm more of a model to my kids, you know, like a role model. They, they see what they want to see. But in the beginning, I'll tell you, they, my wife, you know, God bless her because she made, you know, she, she, she made great kids, period. The, yeah, I think I, I, it's certainly true. Like in the beginning. Uh, how yeah. old's your kid now, Jordan? Uh, 16 months. Oh, okay. Um, so, are so, you does uh, do, and, uh, does the what, does the child even get, care about you in any way, shape, or form? Exactly at this point? Oh right. no, there's, there's love. I, I will say, I, I mean, it was a tough conversation, the Chappelle conversation with my kid. Uh, <laughs> he, again, I, mean, I think he understood it, and it's it, there's nuance there, and again, same kind of thing. Of like, I, I think it's important for you to understand that there's a larger conversation around this special, but. To, to be honest, I'm afraid he doesn't understand the nuance there. And then he's going to go to daycare. And yeah. If, if, you know, he's it could mostly, get ugly. It could get ugly. If, and if <laughs> he mostly could talk about bananas and owls right now, but <laughs> he probably doesn't do I'm much stand up. He does more like, you know, <laughs> sit up once in a while. You know, hey, it all reminds me. You remember when Jim, you probably don't remember because I don't think you guys were born when Jimmy Carter was asked a question in a debate. He said, well, I've talked to my, my daughter, uh, Amy, about nuclear proliferation, and she was like about 10. And people were like, what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, 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 I find myself, now my kids are older, they're 20 and 18. I find myself listening more than, yeah. than speaking um, because they're ahead of the conversation. They're further ahead of the conversation than I am. You know, they, and they're smarter about a lot of this stuff than I am. You know, you, you, you really start to feel like the old man, you know, as your kids get older and, and the, the, you know, the technology changes and you can't keep up and the conversation changes and you can't keep up and the lingo changes and you can't keep up. And you just hope that uh, your kids are patient enough to explain the world to you as you get older. Well, I, I think Michael said something very important in terms of, our kids, you know, the, everything is spinning so fast. The world's going so fast that they're more on cutting edge in some ways, you know, than what where we are. They lead us in some ways. But we also have a responsibility to talk to them about some basic things. What I find is my daughters have their own hopes and dreams, and I can support them, but I got to listen to what their hopes and dreams are rather than to tell them what I think they ought to do 
which is in the image of what I might want. So it requires some patience, Michael, I think, to to let them chart their own course let the, and listen to them about where they want to go and, and not try to force things on them. You know, I don't think just children, but but young adults. My daughters now are going to be 22 years old. They're, they're young women. Uh, they're not kids anymore. But I, they still need some guidance. But I also have to back off and, and listen to them more and let them let them make mistakes and let them live their own life. One of the things I'm learning, having children who are now a little bit older, as I said, 20 and 18, is exactly what you're talking about. One element of it is I, I do think they're, they they want guidance. I do think they want your input. They may not always listen to it, but I think mm-hmm. they want to hear it. The other thing that struck me about kids from a very young age is they will tell you who they are. You can, you can have all the hopes and aspirations for them that you want. You can want them to be whatever you want them to be, and they are going to be who they are because they are just made as their own individual people. And from a very early age, I learned to, 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 to let them show me who they are. That was a really good lesson for me. Um, it doesn't mean you don't parent them, but one of the key lessons of parenting that I learned was the kids are going to guide you as much as you're going to guide them. And not just in terms of them telling you who they are. In a lot of ways, they're telling you who you are. You're seeing the world through their eyes and you have to, you, almost by necessity, you have to step up your game as a human being to be the kind of parent that you need to be. Um, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to do that. I'm grateful to them for the, for the necessity of having to become a better person, uh, in learning just how to be their dad. And Michael, don't you think it's also true? You know, what people say is, you know, the best way to convince people is not by what you say, but how you, how you are and what you do. Yeah. So our kids are watching the decisions that we make, and um, they see the way we carry ourselves, the way we interact with. Them. I mean, it's just it's all of those things, you know. And that that gets back to the ability to have the strength by showing the weakness that we have to improve our lives. You know, yes, I think people when they're older can change, but it yeah. requires them to look at themselves. And I think as a parent, it's also good to just be able to admit when you, when you messed up and yeah. say to your kids, have, yeah. have the humility to say to your kids, I messed up. Please, I'm, I'm looking for your forgiveness in this. I'm apologizing. That kind of modeling, I think, is really important too. As somebody who has a 16-month-old, I don't like any of this conversation. Yeah. <laughs> the, the idea of saying you messed up, I, I don't dare show that kind of weakness in front of my child or even my wife. <laughs> Listening to your kid, I don't know what you're talking about right there. It's mostly gibberish. Uh, I went to a liberal arts college, for God's sakes. He should listen to me. Um, but you know what's funny, Jordan, is you will find, as your, as your son gets a little older, you will recognize behaviors at age three and at, at age 10 that you will, you will recognize that 16-month-old. Like, that person is in there. You know, and and it may not be totally apparent now, but in hindsight, you'll look back and you'll be like, oh my God, you were the same person at 16 months as you are now. And I don't like you any better now than I did then. <laughs> <laughs> I will say it is true that I, like joking aside, it, it, I was so excited to have this little guy and I read all the books on how, you know, this is also a, a selfish, egotistical thing to do, but it's like, how do I use this little child to become a better, more open person myself? And so he is just a conduit <laughs> to try to be more curious, thoughtful and interesting. And I'm watching him like, he's, he's happy in the morning. How, how do I become happy in the morning? How do I become so <laughs> curious? How do I just find joy in eating a banana for 30 minutes? Like I'm, I need to become this, help me be a better man. Yeah. And, uh, but they'll do that. I mean, it, it, it does sound selfish and egotistical and narcissistic. Um, and, and, and I think you are all those things. So congratulations. But I think they, I think they will in they do, they do make you raise those questions about yourself, and I think that can be good. Hey, let me ask you guys one. You were speaking about humility. So you guys are like, you I know, think we were brushing it aside. You, yeah. But you guys are, you know, when you're, you're out there on the stage, when both of you guys have done it, 
you know, for, for a long time and, and successfully, how do you keep that ego in check? What do, what do you tell yourself so that you don't like spin off and think how good you are until the, you know, until all the, cr- all the shit comes down and then you're like, you know, man, I, I really screwed up. How do you, how do, how do you keep the ego in check? One of the great things about show business is that it will always keep your ego in check. Show business will squash you under its heel at every opportunity it gets. So for me personally, ego has never been a problem. I've, I think I've suffered from the opposite, uh, which is feeling like, I, gee, you know, I don't think I'm, <laughs> I don't think I'm worth anything in this business. Um, I'm grateful that for me, I had some success fairly young. I was in my early twenties. Um, and within a few months, I think I recognized that whatever modest fame I had in that moment was essentially meaningless to me. Um, and I was grateful that I, that the fame that I got, because I, I, as Jordan said earlier, I was with a sketch group. We were, we were friends first and we went through all of this together. So we had a support system built in. I don't envy the kids who are 15, 16, 17, who, who find lightning in a bottle and find themselves on the cover of magazines and have to navigate that. I think it would be really difficult. Um, it's hard enough just as an adult to deal with it, to deal with the ups and the downs and the disappointments. But I also think that's true for people in, in a myriad of professions. You know, I can imagine a salesperson having a great month and feeling like they're the shit. And then the next month, you know, they can't move whatever they're trying to sell and feeling like they're the worst. I mean, you have to be able to find some sort of balance and stability in your life, which is why it's so critical that, as you said, Governor, you don't confuse your humanity with your profession and your self-worth with your profession. Yeah, I think think Michael is right. I think failure is a is a a quick quick way to get to humility and i i got lucky that my little taste of success came late and i had at that point been through many different failures and i had learned just through self preservation not to put my uh self worth connected to what an industry tells you now when you get that little taste it's easy to confuse those things and there's definitely times where you want that to be the case and you want that validation that comes from any success to be the validation that you've been striving for for so long but then then that immediately gets pulled away with you know i've had failures and those cut you back down as well. Uh, I then look to even COVID has been a profound experience for me uh, because something that was already coming into shape is, is like, how much do I actually care about some of these things and some of these markers that were there? And I felt, you know, for so many people, this last, these last few years has focused, has made people really, really refocus on what they've actually gotten out of the experiences and the times they put into things. And I think like ambition has been a really interesting thing to start to open up and where I used to always take the idea of ambition as a virtue. Uh, like now there's, there's certain, there's certain elements of ambition that feel like, uh, a a childhood necessity that's now become somewhat of an adult burden. And, and as I begin to unpack that, I'm wondering if I'm chasing the, the, the weird trappings of a kid just to try to, to make that kid happy again. Uh, and long, you know, long story short, this industry can can turn you into an egocentric nightmare, and you have to keep reevaluating what actually is is worthwhile. Uh, but also at the same time, I would say ego is something you have to indulge to give yourself the the ability the to to do yeah. some of those things. Yeah. Where I'm like, oh yeah, I, I I will wear it sometimes, and it might be a false hat, but you. But some of the successes I've had are because I've walked in with the confidence of somebody who was uh, 10 years younger and 20% dumber. <laughs> you know, uh, Michael, here's the, the, the thing is, uh, you know, our, our pal here likes Tom Moreno, who, you know, he's now gone from electric. He's gone reverse Dylan. You know, he's now doing acoustic. But it was uh, some time ago when I, I was talking about, about Justin Bieber, and I brought up this song. It's called Lonely. And it is, it is an amazing song about how nobody gets it. Nobody gets him. Nobody walked in his shoes. He did a lot of stupid things, and no one ever cared. And he's so lonely. It is just, an, I don't know how he wrote that song. I honestly, 
he just he just opened his heart and his soul and i was so struck by it and it's be interesting for for people who are you know famous like you guys are to be in a position to hear a song like that so sometimes these guys uh i happen to be a, a bieber fan and that song just just knocked me out just knocked me and jo- jordan was laughing at me oh you like bieber i like moreno you know so I, but anyway it's just it's worth checking out michael and maybe it, it, listen to it sometime let me know what you think well for the first time in my life I'm going to be Googling a Justin Bieber song, and I'm going, I'm going to listen to it with an open mind. Good. Thank you. This is the, uh, Governor John the Kasich common says. Room, see? <laughs> common ground. <laughs> Finally. <laughs> Just so you don't think, look, you know, I, I, I like Pearl Jam. They're, one of, they're probably one of my favorite bands, and I know all the Halsey and, you know, and Dua Lipa and all the, I know who all okay, these people are. Okay, watch the name drops, so, Governor. You're, yeah, and I don't have you're any, out over the skis. I have you're no out script. over the skis. Uh, but, you know, I like them all, but I, I tell you, I, I'm, I'm taken with that kid. And he's, you know, when anybody is that good, whether they're a comedian, you know, whether they're a, you know, whether they're a songwriter, when you got, or a writer, when scores and scores of people, when they can relate to that person, there's something there. And there's something that has to be paid attention to if you want to gain and learn. Absolutely. I take nothing away from Justin Bieber. I never have and I never will. (laughs) (laughs) And to be clear, the criticisms I had beforehand, they they were not Justin Bieber criticisms. They were just, I was surprised by the the fervent excitement you had surrounding (laughs) Justin Bieber. It had nothing to do with the quality of Justin Bieber or his music. He's a talent. I'm done with this. <laughs> hey, Mike, Michael, let me ask you. I think we're going to, we don't want to have you here forever, but have you enjoyed this? Has this been a surprise to you? This, because, you know, I think a lot of people are trying to figure out what is this thing going to be all about, you know? Tell us what you, how you feel about what's happened here with us today. In 2011, I think. I wrote a book with Megan McCain called America, You Sexy Bitch. And, and Megan and I did not know each other when we set out to write this book. This, I think the relationship was probably similar to you guys. Um, but we had this idea. We thought it would be fun. We rented an RV. We drove across the country for four weeks. We talked to a lot of people. Um, we had great experiences. She was and continues to be a Republican. I was and continue to be a Democrat. And the working hypothesis that we were operating under is a familiar one that I'm, that I think everybody intuitively understands that we as Americans and as humans in general have far much more in common than we do that separates us. And we thought if we could, you know, take a road trip together and see America together, that we would, you know, help to bridge a tiny divide, at least maybe just between the two of us and maybe among some readers. And trust me, not that many people read the book. Um, And it was a great experience. And I made a lifelong friend. And it sounds like what you guys are doing is similar. You know, you're, you're, you're taking an audio road trip and, and, I think those conversations can only be helpful when they're entered into in good faith. And it sounds like that's exactly what you guys are doing. So yeah, I applaud it. And to be clear, we've had lawyers run the copyright and there's no issues. Uh, We're (laughs) in the clear. We can go with this idea. Well, we'll see. out of luck. We'll see because my lawyers are also looking into it. So we'll see. We just feel pretty confident. Uh, (laughs) Now, now that experience and book, that's 2011. I think so. I think that's 2011. Optimism in 2011, here we are now, 2022, how have things changed? They haven't gotten better, I can tell you that. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, no, it's it's more of a shit show. Uh, Gas prices, for one, I got to tell you, we looked at the van, it's already, it's going to cost us an arm and a leg to get out there. Yeah, yeah, somehow, somehow things haven't gotten better. You know, during the Trump years... I thought to myself, I don't think I could write that book again because the divide had become a chasm and it seemed like maybe it was unbridgeable. That being said, I recently moved from the deep blue state of Connecticut 
to the barely bluish tinged state of Georgia. And it's a much different experience um, knowing that culturally I'm an interloper, knowing that culturally I'm somebody who may not have as much in common with my neighbors as I did in Connecticut, and finding that the people here are just lovely, you know, and, and, and finding and knowing that, um, you know, I'm meeting people who definitely did not vote the way I voted in the last election, knowing that they have different fears, different hopes, um, in a, in a macro, in a micro sense, but in a macro sense, they're probably exactly the same. We all want the same stuff. Um, we're just coming at it from different ways. And so I, I feel like, I feel like this move has hopefully opened up my eyes and heart a little bit. Um, and it's, and, and I think it's given me a little bit of hope. Well, Michael, we're all in the same rowboat, you know, everybody's yeah. in the same rowboat. And, you know, the one thing we have to learn is patience with other people and put ourselves in other people's shoes. And then we begin to understand their anxieties and their fears and their hopes. And when we realize that, you know, we all hurt, we're all happy. We got to, we have to mourn with other people. We got to celebrate with other people. We do that. We'll be fine. We'll be fine as a culture. I think we can all believe in that in some form or another. <laughs> uh, well, Michael, thank you for uh, uh, attempting to sketch out that blueprint for uh, how I will live and or die. It's, uh, it's, it's a good use of your time. Yeah, stroke out, buddy. I mean, it's, it's the best. <laughs> thank you guys for having me. That was Michael Ian Black. Listen and subscribe to Michael's podcast, Mike and Tom Eat Snacks. That's with Tom Cavanaugh. And Obscure, he just finished Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. I thought he was great. Yeah, he's a smart guy. I do think in this culture, it's hard to find those those, those mentors or those people you, you look at as walking down a similar path as your own and has found a unique way to... to uh, carve their own path. And I think Michael has done that in such interesting ways. I find him to be so thoughtful and, and reflective and found ways in which to take his interests, his fears, and his vulnerabilities. And he's put those into his work and his conversations. And so uh, hopefully he's made me a better man, which was the name of his book. Thanks, Jordan. Thank you, Governor. Kasich and Klepper is a production of Treefort Media, hosted and executive produced by John Kasich and Jordan Klepper. Treefort Media's executive producers are Kelly Garner, Lisa Ammerman, and Matthew Kuglin. Line producer is Oscar Guido. Audio direction by Tom Monahan, head of audio for Treefort, with production and editing by Maxwell Carney. Talent booking by Blythe Asher. With additional production help from Tim Schauer, Haley Mandelberg, Colin Motel, and Anastasia Ibrahim. This podcast is powered by ACAST. <laughs>